Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to this exclusive interview with uh, Lord Jonathan Marlin, a distinguished figure at the intersection of global commerce and diplomacy. Uh, Lord Marlin currently holds the position of the Chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council and serves as a trustee of the Commonwealth Walkway Trust. His extensive career includes a pivotal role as the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy between 2010 and 14, where he also served as the Chairman of the Prime Minister's Business Ambassadors and the Minister of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, so thank you so much, sir, for taking your time and speaking to us today. It's a great pleasure. So I want to start a little bit with uh, your career, which is really fascinating and interesting for a lot of audience. Uh, it spans both an intersection between politics and business. And you've been the founding director of Jardin uh, Lyod uh, Thompson. Uh, which of your back business background have influenced your approach to politics? How has it approached it? Well, I think there are two elements to politics. One is your uh, public persona, how you make speeches, um, uh, present yourself in public, how you come up with policies. These are totally different things to, and a totally different skill set to managing and running a group of people uh, as I have done in my business career. So if you take, for example, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which uh, I was effectively running the department, it was very easy for me to make the changes. Um, I think, um, I, I don't know whether I was good at it, but it was very easy for me to to um, to carry out the changes, to influence the staff, to make decisions in terms of the operations of that department. What was not difficult, what was not easy, was uh, having to make speeches in the House of Lords, which I'd never really done at the dispatch box before outlining policy taking questions and so initially it would take me probably seven hours to uh, work up uh, the, um, the the knowledge of uh, the subject that I was having to talk on uh, before I spoke on it um, and effectively you you are thrown in at the deep end uh, in that you have no training uh, for this particular role, uh, you obviously understand the job and you understand a certain amount about energy and about uh, um, obviously climate change, but you're no expert on it. And suddenly, overnight, you have become an expert. So that is a very difficult skill base, one which was a challenge to start with. And hopefully I mastered it um, fairly quickly and was able to deal with um, all the issues surrounding that. Uh, under f fairly intensive questioning in the in the chamber of the House of Lords, but also um, making public speeches around the country on that particular subject. So two different skill sets. One, I believe I was very well equipped for. The other, uh, not at all equipped. Um, and hopefully um, I, I was successful at, uh, at by the time I finished. Um, so, sir, as the Prime Minister's trade envoy, how you uh, you played a, cru a crucial role in international trade. How did your experiences in business aid you in the diplomatic role and what lessons from diplomacy do you believe are transferable to the private sector? Yes, well, it's a very good question. Uh, again, I was um, involved in sales. Jardine Lloyd Thompson was an insurance business. So I had been traveling the world with them uh, and uh, we built up this business from nothing actually to uh, being one of the uh, major British uh, companies. Uh, by the time I'd left it, we had over two and a half thousand employees in, six, in, in 60 offices around the world and we started it with just eight of us. So uh, quite used to selling uh, dealing with other businesses, dealing with business people, talking about their issues. So 
dealing again dealing with business people taking them on uh trade missions uh which i did all over the world in my role as the prime minister's trade envoy was the easy bit uh and i i actually found that uh dealing with ministers was also easy because they quite like a business-like approach to things um rather than people uh, saying things which they don't necessarily mean, which often happens in politics. They were perfectly, well, they were very happy to have very straightforward conversations, uh, business-like conversations, because it, it was uh, clear and obvious. So uh, I found balancing the roles, thanks to the indulgence of uh, the ministers I met and the prime ministers and presidents I've met and still do, uh, incredibly generous of them to put up with what I have to say to them and um, they and and uh, you know as a result I've got plenty of friends now in the political world around the world for for that reason so so tackling complex policy issues is a significant aspect of your political career can you explain a, uh, can you share an example of a particular challenging policy issue you faced and how you navigated through it, considering both political and business perspectives? Well, I, uh, when we came into government in 2010, uh, it was after the financial crisis, and um, we had to reduce the size of government. So it was quite complicated and not an attractive task of having to reduce the civil service uh, by a third, having to renegotiate all the government contracts. I was one of the three ministers that renegotiated all the uh, government contracts. And in order to renegotiate a contract, you, you obviously have to understand the dynamics of that contract, whether it be with a law firm or whether it be with uh, um, a tech, tech supplier or whether it be with healthcare, et cetera. So that was um, you know, quite an exciting challenge. But again, I was pretty well equipped to do it without being immodest because obviously I've spent a long time negotiating business deals in my business career. Uh, the complex uh, things were really uh, one of the uh, tasks I had was being responsible for nuclear decommissioning, for example. In the UK, we have lots of nuclear power stations. Um, we uh, process the nuclear waste in uh, a place in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I walked in and observed that we had <clears throat> very poor security around them in, in terms of contemporary security. So we totally transformed that place, which uh, it, making it safe and secure, um, redoing all the security um, because it, 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 was, it could have been a target. Uh, it now isn't. But you, you really had to understand the whole process, what the dynamics were, and clearly, I'd never been involved in nuclear power before that. And then negotiating uh, initially on uh, the building of a new power, a nuclear power station was quite complex. Um, getting to uh, understand the coal industry, which I'd never been involved in, and dealing with the, mine, the, 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 the miners' unions and uh, with, with the uh, past there. And then... Uh, the the whole huge um, aspect of climate change and all the issues that related to that and where where we could move this country or start the process of moving the United Kingdom into a net zero uh, situation, which was very much the desire. Uh, so really getting to understand the dynamics of climate change and what levers you could pull and what were the right levers to pull. So, for example, we inherited a very big program of solar rollout where we were giving massive subsidies to the solar industry. Well, you're living in London at the moment and it's not too much sun out. Uh, whereas in India, of course, you have a lot of sun. And so the solar is a fantastic thing to have. Here we have wind and if you couldn't make electricity out of rain, um, You'd certainly have you'd certainly have no electricity problems ever, um, and so changing the dynamics from to uh, offshore wind, which we which we majored on, 
uh, waste to energy, which I think is very good housekeeping, um, getting uh, a backup system, with, which included gas, where we have 50% of our own gas. So changing those dynamics to better fit the elements that would uh, improve our uh, carbon footprint was also very interesting. And I wanted to move ahead a little bit and ask you that having served as the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy and Chairman of the UK Trade and Investment Business Ambassadors Network, uh, a current issue that we have a lot been debated, and I want to focus on that, that what are the key unresolved issues and points of contention between the India and UK in the ongoing negotiations for the proposed free trade agreement? Uh, free trade agreement, and how do these issues encompass, such as the rules yeah. of intellectual property rights, which you have worked on? Yeah, well, I, I one of my current uh, roles is I sit on the International Treaties Committee, where uh, in the House of Parliament, where we ratify all the government treaties. So uh, the Indian-UK treaty is about to come before us. Um, and uh, as far as I can see, uh, the speed has accelerated in terms of getting to this point of a treaty, uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, it's moved a lot quicker than... Uh, I anticipated and that, and that people anticipated. And the job of our committee will be to make sure that it hasn't moved so quickly that uh, a lot of the loose ends haven't been tied up or that um, uh, things have been overlooked. And so it would be incorrect of me to um, say anything more than that because I haven't seen the treaty details yet. Uh, but that's the process that it now has to go through. And how does uh, this treaty will actually bring the two countries closer? Well, I think any treaty is a, uh, is a declaration of intent. Um, the fact that you beat us at cricket uh, obviously makes things worse for us in terms of our relationship. And it'll be interesting to see how well or badly we do on our next tour of India, which is about to happen in the new year. Uh, but say we beat you at cricket, then we'll be very happy with our Indian relationship. Um, if you beat us, we won't be quite so happy. So, you know, th that's a, one of the wonderful things about soft power is that we have these relationships that are established already. So I, obviously I'm joking when I refer to the cricket, but... Um, I think India and the UK are incredibly aligned. Uh, we have a lot of Indians who live in the United Kingdom. We have a lot of British people who go to India and love going there. I'm one of them. Uh, we have very special relationships uh, in, in that soft power area. Um, and uh, there is a great affection between the two countries. And if we can come up with a sensible uh, arrangement that, that works for both countries, but that isn't just um, more beneficial to one than the other, then of course it will align us more closely. And But in my view, will be just another piece of the Anglo-Indian uh, jigsaw relationships. Um, sir, could you please shed a light on how foreign policies, how, how foreign policy issues are deliberated in the House of Lords, and how does the dynamic of the House influence discussions and decisions on the matters of international importance? Well, it's very hard for me to say that uh, we have a great influence on the outcome of various things, but uh, I mean, I will give you a live example. Uh, when um, uh, David Cameron, the then Prime Minister, called to see me and said, um, I want to talk to you about uh, the possible invasion of Syria. I said to him, you know, I, I, I don't think the British people want it, um, but that's for you to decide. But from the House of Lords point of view, I can assure you, you will have a absolute deluge of objection uh, from some of the real experts in the land, former foreign ministers, former 
permanent undersecretaries, people like myself who travel the world um, and see a lot of the world. Uh, and th they will be very against uh, an intervention. So uh, it would have been interesting for uh, to see what actually happened had we uh, attempted to invade Sy Syria. Luckily, it was it was warded off in the House of Commons. So th the Lords have a um, a really strong presence of, of international people who got international experience, who prioritise it because uh, it isn't prioritised in the commons and, um, uh, you know, therefore have a degree of influence through the debate, through questions, etc. Um, but I wouldn't want to oversell that point because in the end it's the elected politicians who uh, have the determining factor. Yeah. And uh, moving on from that, actually, this is something which uh, recently happened and I thought of uh, bringing into this conversation because uh, during external affairs minister Esha Shankar's recent visit to UK, which just concluded yesterday, yeah. uh, there was yeah. a dis uh, dis uh, discussion actually with the UK Home Secretary and National Security Advisor. And it included uh, something that has been of India's concern about the uh, pro-Khalistan extremism and the safety of Indian diplomats. And we have seen uh, earlier attacks on the Indian High Commission. So how does uh, the minister envision collaboration between uh, India and UK to mitigate risk associated with extremist activities while maintaining diplomatic freedom? Well, I don't think it's a serious issue uh, here. Um, you know, there are there is the right of people to protest and there are issues uh, in India which people who live in this country, Indians who live in this country, feel strongly about. And so they are allowed the right to protest. Uh, it has to be a, a peaceful protest. If it's not peaceful, they get arrested and put into prison. And the police, we have a very strong p police presence that vigorously protects that. Um, like in every country, there are always incidents that happen that uh, you're not expecting. But uh, by and large, I don't see that as a, a, a principal issue. Touch wood. I mean, I really hope that nothing serious does happen. Um, I, I think um, the interesting thing about Jay Shanker's visit was his. it was the first person who David Cameron saw our new foreign minister. And of course, they've known each other for a very long time. So that is, in my view, one of the great benefits of having David Cameron as foreign minister in that he has strong friendships, having been prime minister in this country for six or seven years um, uh, and having you know, established strong links uh, internationally. So it, it would have been, I'd like to have been at the meeting. Um, obviously, I wasn't. Uh, but... Um, it would have been, you know, the, the, the wouldn't have had to have been much sort of introducing each other because they knew each other. And uh, most people who know David Cameron know he's a very straight talking, decent man. And I'm sure that's that helps the uh, the relate that will help the Indian UK relationship uh, and indeed uh, make the trade deal uh, easier to activate. Uh, just following up on that, because uh, it's interesting because our relation with, for example, Canada, if you have seen uh, in the recent time, <laughs> actually, has taken yeah. a little backseat uh, because uh, we do share a good diplomatic relation, especially with so uh, soft power of especially our Indian diaspora. Uh, yeah. But with a uh, peaceful and not so peaceful protest uh, taking place in Canada with the pro Khalistan movement has taken a backseat. Uh, last, uh, I mean, uh, I think around March or April, the attacks on the Indian embassy, uh, the high commission was actually became a talking point. And we have seen back to and fro uh, between the Indian government and the UK government in this issue. Uh, it's, it's a problem because the Indian government has its own uh, idea or way in which it wants to say what is freedom of free speech and the UK government will have its different say. Uh, for someone who have been in for making uh, been at the uh, see, uh, at the front seat of looking at foreign policies and negotiations are made, how would you actually address this issue to someone like an Shankar who comes in 
that that this issue is of an eminent importance well as i said earlier you know the, we we have a policy of freedom of speech uh, that's the cornerstone of our democracy it is the oldest democracy in the world uh, we think it's right we we have to deal with um protests and uh, disagreements not just from indian uh residents in this country but from all manner of uh, residents we're a very international country so we we're, we're having to deal with protests all, all the time i walk down whitehall and there's always someone protesting about something um and uh, of course that's one of the reasons why they don't live in the country that they're born because uh, they don't like the regime that they've in inherited uh, and and for that reason they think they moved to the united kingdom and have expression free expression uh, of speech so you're always going to walk a div a, a fine line between allowing people free expression and free and trying to prevent them from turning that into uh, something that isn't a peaceful process um and uh you know it, it's always going to be uh, a, a, an issue and as for your canadian relationships obviously i'm not going to go there but as i saw when i saw your uh, your prime minister modi i said to him the great thing about india there's an indian in every commonwealth country and lots of them um so so how do you envision the future of india's global prominence and its relationship with the united King kingdom well i think uh, india is the fastest growing economy in the world um it's a uh, incredibly entrepreneurial uh, vibrant uh, country which is mo moving and changing at an enormously fast pace um i, I don't want to be disparaging or sound disparaging but uh the pace with which india is now moving is a totally different one from the past uh and they were having to do you were having to do quite a lot of catch up in, in truth but now you look at india at the forefront of tech the forefront of med tech um the forefront of manufacturing i mean it's an extraordinary vibrant country uh and it's almost like um a um you know a, 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 a sort of industrial tiger has been released or a business tiger has been released and uh this is a, a very very exciting time i think the uk are very well placed with our relationship with india because it's historic uh i don't think most indians look upon Uh, I don't think most Indians I want to say I don't think most Indians look upon uh, the UK as a colonial past country uh, they look upon the UK in a very friendly light it's really only the politicians that like to ramp up that particular side of things and I think it's very injudicious of them because it isn't actually uh, how both the British and the in uh, Indian people think um particularly your generation so um you know i i think if the politicians are careful of their rhetoric the whole thing is is very set for a terrific friendly alliance and um if india enforce the rule of law in a more uh, aggressive way than they have done in the past in a more efficient way than they have done in the past they'll find inward investment will be um manifest and they'll find uh trading practices will be really enhanced um so moving to a current uh, current issue there has been a growing sense of anti-semitism in the uk with the ongoing israel hamas war and the bbc has been criticized for its reporting how do you perceive this well i think uh, there is pro uh, pro israel and, and anti israel i mean you know the, the the issue is that in this country we have a lot of muslims uh, and we have a lot of uh, jews so you're going to have pressure from both sides um and that is uh, going back to our earlier conversation 
um, the issues that the police and the public have to deal with. Uh, as I said earlier, if these are peaceful processes, then it's perfectly acceptable to express opinions. This is a wretched and horrible state of affairs, uh, and there's no point pretending either. And people quite rightly feel very, very strongly about uh, what has happened on both sides. Um, and uh, uh, and inevitably, when people feel strongly, they protest. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of last questions. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, uh, going back to our initial conversation about uh, Britain's role in shaping up uh, or trying to actually get involved in how affair, the world affairs, in fact. Uh, I understand that there are domestic issues grappling uh, UK, but how do you view the role of the British government, particularly uh, we have seen with Prime Minister Sunak's visit to Israel in addressing the ongoing conflict in the Middle East and the humanitarian situation in Gaza, or for example, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war? Well, I think that um, uh, the UK have a big international role uh, we have a seat at the table in terms of international politics, largely because we're very happy to deploy our armed forces. Uh, we have long traditions as a nation with uh, these countries. It, in, in, inevitably, it was Churchill and um, Baldwin, etc., who formed, and, and other prime ministers who helped in the formation of Israel and the separation there. So we have a, a long interest. Uh, and a long diplomatic interest. So I think it's important that we exercise that in trying to deliver peace and a resolution. Uh, and so inevitably, uh, Rish Rishi Sunak went to Israel to try and do that. And we must continue with that initiative. Yeah. So the last thing that I wanted to ask you is for anyone who wants to enter politics or for anyone who wants to start a career in working for a, a member of a parliament or policy work, a young professional uh, of our age, actually, what would be your message and what would you tell them? Don't do it. It's a ghastly profession. Um, you know, and the, the, the problem we have in politics at the moment is the relationship with politics and the press and the people with uh, the amount of abuse that you can throw at a person online or in the press without being unfettered makes life extremely difficult. In politics, you are never rarely appreciated. You're always criticised and uh, you're lucky to get out of it alive. Um, and I find it extraordinary that uh, people want to become professional politicians. I was lucky in that I'd had a business career and various other uh, interests beforehand. Um, I was also lucky I wasn't <laughs> elected because that would have taken up a, a lot of time. Um, and in the end, why I did it was because uh, the country was in a pretty bad state, still in a bad state, by the way, um, after the financial crisis. And uh, I thought, uh, and the Prime Minister was kind enough to think I could help uh, bring us out of it. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, I, I did four years of trying to do that. I did it unpaid. And um, it, it was a fascinating experience, but I never allowed myself to get too close to the sun, uh, I don't mean uh, 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 the, the, the hot part of politics, which is the, um, the, um, the, the attention that you get from press and um, the general public. Um, and the moment you do that, you put your head above the parapet, you are in for a very difficult time. And you just look at the criticism and, and that Cameron has had for taking on a, a job as foreign secretary. I mean, it's just amazing. Here is a guy who's earning a very substantial amount of money, who's enjoying being with his family, who, and enjoying playing tennis with me once a week. Um, not always once a week, but quite frequently. 
um, and playing and, and, and doing various other interesting things and has now committed himself to public service for the near future because he thinks the country needs it. And that is a very, very admirable strait. But you, you don't see many people saying, gosh, you are kind to do this for us. Um, and that's the problem with politics. And I'm sure your prime minister, who I have huge regard for, um, <laughs> must feel very unloved at the times. Thank you so much, sir. And we really appreciate your, you taking out your time and speaking to us today. Great Thank pleasure you. and good luck.